So, hello everyone. Hi. I'm glad to see you here. It also is a great place. We have first time here. And yeah. today we'd like to tell you a story of superheroes and superpowers. So you may be surprised, but we really think that machine learning is a kind of superpower in computer science world. And every superpower has some origins. Like and a radioactive spider, right? Yeah, radioactive spiders. And mm. in case of machine learning, it's math. And we think it's quite important and helpful to understand the, at least the basic math behind machine learning when, are you, when you use your machine learning methods, libraries, and so on. So, my name is Łukasz Gebel. That's my friend Piotr Strzajka. Hello again. And we are software engineers at TomTom. We work literally here in Łódź, in Poland. And we work in location and navigation services department. When we build services like routing, search, matrix routing... Uh, Geofencing maps. Yeah. So, today we'd like to give you a big picture view of machine learning at first, the intuition, and then we'll go through supervised learning and unsupervised learning, focusing on the math behind it. And of course, in the end, we'd like to answer your questions. Okay, so let's start with some simple definitions. So, the first one by Arthur Samuel, who is like a founding father of AI. And according to him, machine learning is a field of study which gives your computers, your programs, the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So very often, it's hard to write a good algorithm that works perfect. So for example, if you want to write an algorithm that recognize your friend on a photo, it's quite hard to use your imperative style programming, like if something happens, then yes. do something. And in such cases, you can use machine learning. And in the picture, you can see that Arthur Samuel is playing checkers with the computer that was able to learn how to play checkers by playing with human players. Okay, the second <coughs> definition. So when we were studying, and we had to implement intelligent method. That was our task. But we didn't know what does it mean, so we asked our lecturer, and he told us that he considered every method that needs some kind of training as an intelligent or machine learning method. And he used this intuition that people and animals are usually considered to be intelligent, and we also need some kind of training when we try to solve some task, to master them. Okay. So that's the big picture view, the intuition behind machine learning methods. But it's easy to say, make your computer learn, make your program learn. But I cannot give a book to my computer. Yeah. It won't learn. Yeah, it, it doesn't work that way, yeah? So there is a workaround, it? right? Yeah. Let's look at the supervised learning. Mm -hmm. So I like to compare supervised learning to being taught by a teacher. So where, when, when, where you were at, at school, your teacher probably gave you some examples how to solve very complicated problems like adding numbers. So she or he gave you examples like one plus one is two, and the correct answer, two. So the, there is an example and the correct answer. And you can use these examples to generalize and solve the <laughs> task. That's how you learned. The same applies to supervised learning. So at first, you need to choose a model. It's like a mathematical model, like your student that will solve the task. Then you need to prepare your data set, the consisting of examples and correct answers for each of the examples. Then you present the examples to your model, check how it responds, <coughs> and then adjust the model parameters so it responds correctly. And that's how it learns. Sorry. Yeah. And one of the biggest family of algorithms in machine learning world are neural networks, and they have really vast number of applications from computer, sci uh, computer vision uh, to, to data compression and many, many more. An interesting fact is that they were inspired by our biological brain mechanisms. So let's have a quick look at the biological neuron. In our neurons, electrical signals from different neurons goes through dendrites, and they go to our neuron cell, and there, these signals are summed up, and if this sum is bigger than the given threshold, it goes through a single axon, which is the output of our neuron. And this axon goes to different neurons, and that's how our neurons affect each other. 
and this intuition was used to build an artificial neuron. So here we've got inputs, these x numbers, these are real numbers, and these are the parts of your examples from your data. And there are also weights, these are also real numbers, and how does it work? So you need to multiply each input by corresponding weight. Then you sum it all up, put this sum into activation function, and the result of the activation function is the single real number, which is the output of your neuron. Okay, activation function, one of the very popular one, the classical one, I would say, yeah. is sigmoid. It looks like this. And sigmoid simply maps your sum to the value from 0 to 1. And it's continuous, nonlinear. And by nonlinear, I mean that the input is not proportional to its output. And it looks like this. You can use it to put it inside your artificial neurons. The problem with neural networks is that they are quite hard to understand at first glance, especially when, are, when you are a beginner in this field. There are a lot of indices, math behind it. So we'd like to explain how it works with the simple e example, simple method, linear regression. Because linear regression is like a very simple method for modeling relationships between variables. So for example, you can check how house price relates to its size. Okay, and we also like to explain things using real-life examples, but we think that superheroes have really cool lives. So we'll yeah, use we have examples from real lives of superheroes. Okay, so let's imagine that you're a superhero or you're looking at the superheroes and ask yourself a question, what defines a true superhero? So let's think for a moment, you can shout it out if you like, or Piot will come up with some crazy idea. Okay, so what defines a superhero? Any ideas? Superpowers. superpowers. Yeah, superpowers are great, like shooting lasers from your eyes, being super strong. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah. Correct. Any and what? anyone else? Morality. 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 Oh, okay. that's, that's awesome, that's yeah. awesome. I appreciate it, really, really good one. Piot, maybe you? Yeah, so I'd say a long nose. Long nose, like a Pinocchio. Yeah. So you, you can be a clothes hanger or something uh, yeah, like that? Yeah, you can take kitties from the trees, or like you a can fireman. You can be super liar, like Pinocchio. True. Okay. In my opinion, costume is quite important. We shouldn't judge the book by its cover, but of course there are some situations, things happen, and let's imagine that you're in trouble, you need help, and you meet the guy to the right. So this guy yeah. probably doesn't look very reliable, and you are like thinking, oh god, I'm going to die. Yeah. So <coughs> superhero needs a good costume. This guy's superpower is probably being super creative, but original <laughs> Thor is really strong, he looks perfect, he's really good. And we're in Oslo, so Thor is really cool. Yeah. He's the best. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so every superhero needs a good costume. So let's state our problem. I'm a superhero, wanna be superhero, I want to be popular, I want to invest some money in my costume. So we did a serious scientific data research and yeah. we have found most published superheroes ever. <coughs> so we've got a number of comic book issues in which each superhero appears. And for yeah. these superheroes, we also checked on eBay how much you have to pay for its costume. So our data looks like this, we've got costume price, and number of comic book issues. And we will use this data to predict how popular you will be for the given amount of money mm. invested in your costume. And we'll do it in a machine, le a machine learning framework. Yeah. Okay, you can always learn something interesting from your data. And this time we learned that you have to pay over $100 for invisible woman costume, which looks like this. And it's probably somewhere there. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two options. Yeah, either it's a brilliant scam and everyone should really invest in such a way of selling stuff. Yeah, or it's a really good costume because I can see anything there and everyone should buy it now, including us. But we will leave the decision to you. Okay, let's back to the, the math. So our model in linear regression is simple line equation. So we've got two parameters, theta zero and theta now one. But all of these are numbers. and our in our data, we've got this costume price, which is like x, 
And the result of our function, f, is the number of comic book issues for the given costume price. That's our model. So we'll need to adjust data parameters. OK, so our data looks like this, if we plot them. And our task is to find the line that fits it in a more optimal way. So it may be here or here or somewhere else. We will find out. OK, so how to do it in a machine learning favor? How to train it? So first of all, we'll need an objective function. And objective function is the function that evaluates your model. So you can say it's good or it's bad. And in our case, it looks like this. And it means that we need <coughs> to take every point from our data set and calculate such a sum, this sigma symbol. So we need to calculate the value of our function, putting the x as an input <coughs> to our function from our data point, and then subtract expected value, y, so number of comic book issues, <coughs> and square all of it and put it to our sum. But let's give a simple example. So let's say that for one point in our data set, our function for the given theta parameters, for the given x, gave us 4. But we were expecting 2. The y is 2. So in this formula, we've got 4 minus 2. It's 2. 2 squared, it's 4. It means that we need to add 4 to our sum. For different point, our function may give us 1. And, me, we, we, and we may expect it 1. So we've got 1 minus 1, it's 0. 0 squared, it's still 0. So we don't need to add anything to our function. So you see that if the output of the model matches the expected output, the value is 0, or it's really small if the difference is really, really small. So the less, the better. It means that we need to minimize our objective function. And to do this, we will use the gradient descent algorithm. And for me, gradient descent is like a biggest superhero in machine learning world, because you can find this idea in much more complicated methods, in neural networks, in deep learning, and, and so on. So the idea stays the same. Of course, formulas can be a little bit different, a little bit complicated, but the main idea will be the same. It's, it's, it's the crucial part of understanding how does it work. So in our case, it's simple iterative algorithm. When we update our theta's parameters in every iteration according to these formulas. So there are two formulas because we've got two parameters in our model. And how does it work? So you need to subtract uh, alpha, which is a small real number. It's a learning rate multiplied by these complicated <laughs> formulas, which are derivatives of our objective function that I showed you before. And you are probably thinking, like, come on, dude, derivatives, really? So last time we calculated derivatives is probably at studies, and now you want us to understand these this complicated formulas. But really the crucial thing about derivatives is that the derivative gives you information of how your function is changing. So if it's increasing, it's positive. If it's decreasing, it's negative. If your function is constant, it's zero. That's, that's the idea behind deri derivatives. It's, it's not very scary, really. OK, so let's look at the plot and visualize the problem. So let's say that our objective function looks like this, and we've got only one theta just to simplify the plot, to put it in 2D dimension. And let's say that we calculate our derivative at this point. At this point, our function is increasing, so the derivative will be positive. And in our formula, we've got theta minus alpha multiplied by the positive derivative. So it's like minus times positive, it's minus. It means we need to subtract something from our theta. Subtracting means we are going to the left. So at this <coughs> point, in next iteration, derivative is still positive. So we do the same, we subtract something from our theta. And here we do the same until we reach the minimum. On the other hand, we could start with this point, and here the function is decreasing. So the derivative will be negative. So we've got minus alpha times minus derivative. M negative times negative gives us positive value. It means we need to add something to our theta. 
So we are going to the right. And here again, function is still decreasing. So we are adding one more, and again, until we reached the minimum. So the idea behind gradient descent and derivatives is like going down the hill until you reach the minimum of your function. That's the main crucial idea. OK, so now let's solve our problem. So I will be using Octave. A uh, cheap knockoff of MATLAB, but you know, still it's very good. It works. Yeah, it has quite simple <coughs> syntax, and of course you can use you can use any technology, any language you like. Yeah, we just wanted to stay as close to math as we can, and using vectors is super easy in Octave. Yeah. So here we've got our objective function. So here is the theta, but this theta is a vector, so underneath there are two numbers, and it's multiplied by our data points x, so it's like the f function. We subtract the expected values, all of it is squared and divided by the number of, of uh, our data points. That's the objective function and the gradient descent algorithm. So it's a simple <laughs> for loop. <coughs> and we've got our data updated by subtracting this derivative formula. That's, that's how this, it works. And the main program, so I load our costume data, the points that you've seen before. <coughs> Then I extract x's, once the expected uh, values, the number of comic book issues. I initialize theta here, it doesn't matter really, and set our alpha rate to be a small real number, and I will run it for 1,000 iterations, run the gradient descent, and I will get the optimal thetas. That's how we learn linear regression. So let me run the code, and our data looks like this. It's not very helpful, so let's plot the result. And we've got our answer. So it looks like that our optimal function looks like this. And that's probably, if you have to use your human eyes to put a line, you will probably put it somewhere there. OK, so now our wannabe superhero can use it. So let's say that I would like to invest $1,000 in my costume. So I can check my function. It's $1,000 around here. And according to my model, I should appear in around 8,000 comic book issues, which is a quite good uh, result. Eight yeah. comic books for a buck. Well, yeah. yeah, and we solved solving this problem. We also learned something about human nature, something set. So you can see that the more you pay, the more popular you are. And probably that's why Batman's superpower is being super rich. Yeah. OK. So let's get back to the presentation. OK. Here we are. And linear regression is cool, but it's linear. Thank yeah. you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and let's say that you'd like to separate Marvel superheroes from DC superheroes. There are like two different universes. In ideal world, you, should, you could use a linear regression and just put a straight line between them. It would work, yeah? But in real life, data is much more complex. It's all of this complicated, mixed, and you need to do this like this, to use nonlinear methods. And that's the part where neural networks comes to the rescue. So simple neural network, classical one, shallow, look like this, so we've got three layers, the yellow one, these are just inputs. This, this neuron just passes your examples to the hidden layer, the blue ones. And in blue neurons, you've got this sigmoid activation function. And then you've got the output layer, which produces the final output of the whole neural network. And here you also have this sigmoid function. The green ones with plus one, they are called biases and you can think of them like they give your neural network some kind of flexibility while fitting to this space. <coughs> so your neural network can like move around your examples. OK, and when you want to train your neural network, the first step is to randomly initialize every weight of every neuron. That's, that's what you need at first. <coughs> then you are showing your examples. And so you take the first example, you put it on the input, inputs goes to the first neuron, you multiply inputs by weights, calculate the activation function, do the same with the second neuron, the third one, and then the activation function results, the outputs of the hidden layer, 
goes as inputs to the output layer. And here you do the same. So you also multiply inputs by the weights of the output neuron, calculate the activation sum, and you get the output of your neural network. Of course, if you need, you can have more neurons in the output layer also. And now you can compute the error. So you can check the expected value and check how it differs from your output of your neural network. <coughs> OK, and now how to learn it? You can use backpropagation algorithm. And it's backpropagation because you take this error that you computed and you push it backward through your network. And while doing this, you can use the, this gradient descent algorithm to update every weight of every neuron. So it's the same as we are updating our datas, but now you need to update every weight of every neuron with the gradient descent. Of course, the formula will be a little bit different because now you will have the derivative of the sigmoid function. But the idea is the same by minimizing the, the error. So I've got the error, I push it backward, I also do all of this in multiplications and so on, and I'm updating every weight of every neuron. That's how you learn neural network. Okay, and when we finally understood how it works, and we were really proud and happy, but then our lecturer came to us and, come on guys, don't be such a smart asses, it's just a randomized optimization. And at first we were like, hell no, hell no, it's like a rocket science and we love it. Yeah, the binnacle of engineering, you yeah. can't get better. Yeah, but to be honest, that's, that's true. It's yeah. not a magic. Sadly, there is no yeah. magic. It's more or less complicated math, and that's how our machine learning AI works nowadays. So it's just a math. Still, it's extremely <coughs> powerful, helpful tool that helps you solve the really complex problems. Okay, so our superhero has a costume now, he wants a logo because, you know, you need to sh sell the, the T-shirts, merchandise, and logos are usually nonlinear. And like this Iron Man logo you can see here. So let's generate our logo, our own logo, with the use of this shallow neural network. So I will come back to the octave. Oh, it's almost like Batcave from <laughs> Batman. Okay. So I've got my neural network code and generate logo code. Uh, maybe I will show you the data first. So let's say plot grid. I will use the grid of 2D points. So our data will have X and Y. And every point has a label. So when I display it, these are X and Y and the label 1 or 0. And I want my neural network to learn which points are ones and which points should have label zero. Simple as that. Then I will plot them with different colors and we will see what happens. Okay, so I load my data. Our X now has two inputs. So every example has two numbers and the expected output one or zero. I will uh, run it for 1000 iterations. I will use 200 hidden neurons and train my neural network. And then I will take the same data and put it to the already trained network and make it generate my labels again. And I will draw these this labels. Okay, so let's run the code. Generate logo. Okay, it's running. It takes some time because all of this gradient descent stuff multiplication is happening. And we should be ready. Oh, it's ready now. So now let's load data, input input and predicted oops, values and ta -da, it occurred that our neural network learned how to distinguish points that are inside Batman equation that are from points that are outside of it. So simply these points had different labels and our neural network learned by this because I've prepared the data this way. But there are two problems with this. First of all, Batman logo is already taken. Yeah, so we cannot use it. We don't have, want to have problems. And the second one, <coughs> I put the same data that was visible, appeared in our training set, and neural network already seen it. And then I make it to guess it again, but it's not a big deal to guess the values that you already seen. It's like learning by heart. 
So now I will use the data that wasn't appearing in the training. So I will use around 25,000 points. In the, our training set, we had only 600 points. And we will see how our neural networks works on the new data. So we need a new trooper superhero logo. So I just use a thicker grid. I will show you that thicker grid don't have labels. Sorry, low data. And now thicker, thicker grid. So now I have only points. And the labels will be completely generated by our neural network. Okay, so get back to the code. I load this, <coughs> these points, extract inputs, and I put them to the already trained network to predict labels. So let me run it, generate true superhero logo, and here we go, and plot results again. You see it's much thicker. Yeah, and we've got our logo, and it may be like, I don't know, Flying squirrel man, uh, an elephant or man. something like that. Elephant yeah. man with a short trunk, maybe. Yeah, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. Also, so you see, it's a not perfect Batman logo. Yeah, it's not perfect, and that's how machine learning methods work. They won't give you the perfect solution because getting the perfect solution is not easy, and you still get a very, very good ones. It's a quite complicated, non-linear, non-linear uh, logo. You, we could probably fix it because we could <coughs> probably add some more data to make it more round. We could fix our parameters, maybe. Ma our model is probably overfitted be because we've got a lot of neurons. We trained it quite long for 1,000 iterations. So we could probably make it better. But this shows how machine learning methods works and what are the problems behind it. OK, so I hope I proved that our neural networks can solve nonlinear problems. And now, Piotr will tell you what happens when there is no teacher in the classroom. Yes, thank you. Uh, so what we want to do now is we want to do the unsupervised learning. Uh, and although we can let our neural networks learn by themselves, uh, to no surprise, it's still not Skynet, because Skynet would be more <coughs> like AI, and we're still in the machine learning times. So let's see, why would we even let them learn? First of all, well, we're programmers, we can be lazy, and you know, it, they, it, this unsupervised learning way uses much simpler math, because you don't have to push any errors, or you don't have to calculate derivatives. You just can use simple adding, subtracting, dividing, multiplication, and you're good to go. And the second thing is that we use it mostly for grouping, so we try to find similar similarities within stuff. And, well, I think the best, uh, this idea is shown the best uh, using some completely different scientific study, because there was a study how our thinking influences, uh, how our language influences our thinking. And scientists took children from all around the world and showed them, well, a similar picture to this one, uh, and asked the question that almost every child has been asked in the history of the world, which doesn't fit. And of course, most European children said, grass doesn't fit because cow and chicken are animals, and grass is a plant. But some of the children, mostly from Asian cultures, said that, well, chicken doesn't fit, because cow eats grass, and you know, chicken doesn't eat grass, it doesn't eat the cow, and it doesn't work the other way around, so it's not eaten by the grass. So if you see, the logic in both cases is equally good, but the way it is applied uh, makes the answer different. And the same is with unsupervised learning. Sometimes the similarities that are found can be a bit surprising, because even though it is unsupervised learning, we have to take into consideration for the functions we use, what we really want to, to check, what is the main thing of our interest. And so, uh, we let them learn, because sometimes we don't, we don't know what we want. So we know the general way, but the data is quite uniform. And finding a key or keys isn't so obvious. Or on the other way around, uh, data is so unique that each individual ex uh, uh, case can be a, a different group. So, and we want to have some groups, mostly the number we calculate by ourselves. So the first person who thought that we can 
apply such a logic to neural networks was Professor Donald O'Hab. So in fact, he was working at the biology department, but it was around the same time the first neural networks were created, so he, he just was su super uh, happy that, you know, he's studying the real brain, and now we're creating our own artificial brain. So now we know that it's not really true, but, you know, the idea st uh, stood with us until today. He came up with an idea that if a natural brain cell works in such a manner that if a signal comes to that brain cell and it responds, the next time the similar signal comes, the response is a bit bigger. So, and so the simple Hebbian learning algorithm was born. And as you can see, the change of the weight is just proportional, and the proportion is uh, the learning coefficient. So it's proportional to the input to that weight and the output of the whole neuron. So we're taking the consideration if the neuron responded at all. Of course, you probably see that adding this to the weight will just make it grow exponentially. And the same was foreseen by the professor, so he just came up with another generalized algorithm that says that it's a kind of function between input and output, and we have to find a fitting uh, function for our solution. So today, for the sake of simplicity, we'll stay with the simple Hebbian learning algorithm, because first of all, we will see where it runs a bit short, and you will also see that in most cases, it really has some good answers, but maybe not so good as other algorithms. So the neuron yeah, is frankly the same as previously, except there's this little module uh, down that uh, adjusts the weights using simple Hebbian learning algorithm. So you can use the same neurons as Lukas used previously. And how does it look when we're teaching this stuff? So when it learns, in fact, because we're not touching the teaching part. So the signal comes, we add the bias, then we calculate, uh, we multiply weights times input, we have these partial sums that we then sum up and put into uh, activation function. Then, using this activation function, we take the inputs, we take the output of the activation function, we create the changes of weights, and those changes are applied to the weights, so the neuron for the next example is ready with its new weights and can be easily taught. So. I will show you now a part of demo, so we'll stay with, with the superheroes because, frankly, we have a superhero with a super costume and with a logo. Now we need to join a superhero team because, well, that's a logical step forward, right? So we heard that Avengers have some vacancies lately, so we, th we think that maybe we can join the Avengers. And we've chosen this for most popular guys. Of course, there is Thor because we love him. He's the best. And so... Captain America, he's a kind of general, he's the natural born leader, but in a way so is Thor, he's the son of the king, uh, well he's frankly the god of war, so he knows all about it. Uh, so maybe Captain America can find another group. Uh, so the similar stuff is with Iron Man, so he has his repulsive race, but Thor is a god of thunder, so he, he just you know, commands lightning, so maybe not today. And Hulk, we saw him fighting Thor, but, you know, in the third Thor movie, Hulk even uh, lost to Thor in a fight. So maybe we can find some better companions for Thor and put our superhero in its place. So the general idea is that we take some superheroes, we divide them into groups, and they then take one superhero from those similar superheroes. We take one from each group and create a kind of optimal team. Right. So you want to build like a super duper squad. Yeah? Yes. Cool. And to do that, we need some superheroes. So we took some data from Marvel database because every superhero is described using those six attributes. And what is more, we selected uh, those that are quite different. So we can use those vectors as a unique representation of our superheroes. So let's come back to Octave. I will show you the data that once more and we'll We'll see how the Hebbian learning algorithm works for that. So I will just jump to the unsupervised learning. And these are the superheroes. So you can see the vectors. And you can see we're dividing these values by 7. It's called normalization. And we do it because we want to have, for, for this kind of learning, we want to have values between 0 and 1, or between minus 1 and 1. So 
in, in this particular case, it, those values will be between 0 and 1 because the minimum value of each of those parameters is 1 and the maximum is 7. So we're dividing by the maximum value and we're having those pretty nifty uh, li little numbers so we can work with them. And Hebbian learning. Like that's, that's quite easy. So we're adding to the learning vector. So this is, this is where our example comes. We're adding 1. So it's the bias that you've seen previously. Then we're calculating the output. So using, uh, uh, using Octave, it's really easy because as we're using vectors, this uh, multiplication, in fact, not only uh, multiplies inputs by uh, uh, times weights, but also adds them together. So we have a single value that we then push into sigmoid. So we know what is the output. Uh, then for our convenience, we're calculating the winner. So we have to have a way of showing which, uh, of which neuron responded for the given example. So this is the way we do it. Uh, we're creating a winner vector, and then we're updating weight, weight of the vector if, of course, the learning coefficient is set. So we are in the training mode. Uh, to show you how it works, we'll be uh, showing our superheroes 100 times. So we call every time we show the whole uh, exa example group to our neural network, we call it an epoch. So we'll show these examples 100 times. And this is the learning coefficient. It's quite small, but as we previously uh, saw, they can rise quite quickly within Hebbian learning. So we want to counter that somehow. You will see that although it's a very small number, we still get values that are a bit out of place. Oh, sorry, I forgot to load superheroes, and now we can now, now we can run this stuff quite smoothly. Okay, so you can see that every column is a neuron, and every one in the column means that this neuron responds to this superhero. And what we can see here is that, well, although we have four neurons, only two responded, and the second one is really, really weak. If I run it several more times, you will see that it's a kind of normal situation. I would like to have those... Okay, so these groups look the best. I would like to stay with, with the groups that look a, a, a bit better than, than one group that takes them all, because we'll come back to the Hebbian learning after that. So uh, I think that shows that there is something fishy going with Hebbian learning. And well, that's, that's really not a problem, because well, those wages rise at infinity, and maybe if we don't use simple Hebbian learning algorithm, we could tackle it using a m more fitting function. Uh, and, you know, now some of those neurons, they just starve a bit to death, because if those uh, neurons that have risen their wage, wages very fast, uh, then if, if even a small simulation stimulation comes, uh, they just... Uh, respond with such a high value that those others, they have no chance to become uh, masters of their own groups. So we should do something about it. And of course, we can uh, tweak the parameters and stuff. But let's just jump to something completely different. Well, maybe not completely different, but something better. We will let them self-organize. So we'll give, we are giving them more freedom, uh, hopefully not to create unions, rather to you know help us uh, fix that problem, and one of the groups of uh, unsupervised learning uh, is learning with concurrency. And learning with concurrency, in fact, strips our neurons from most of their functionality. So now they're a kind of agents because they're not only vectors of weights. So what we're trying to do now, we'll be trying to make this vector a kind of everyman of the group it represents. So it will be a vector that is the closest vector to all the uh, entities in the group it represents. And we can do it in two ways. So in winner-takes-all algorithm and in winner-takes-most algorithm. I think they're quite s self-explanatory, but for the sake of this presentation. So winner-takes-all uh, ma uh, makes us create a kind of ranking, a neighborhood from the neuron that is the closest to the given example to the one that is the farthest. And we select only the best one, and we let it learn. And the others, they're waiting for their chance to find their own group. And in the winner-takes-most, uh, we create the same kind of ranking, but now uh, we let, uh, let everyone learn 
the first one the most, but the subsequent ones, so the first, second, and so on, runner-ups, they will have their chance. So the idea is we want to give them some chance to explore the solution space and find their niche. Yeah, so it's like democratizing the learning process for all of the neurons. Yes, that's right. So the idea looks as so that we have our neuron and its weights, and we have an example. Then we calculate partial distances between each of the values. And using these partial distances, we can calculate the distance between this neuron and the example. So in this presentation, we're using simple Euclidean distance, but you can use any one you like, the more complicated ones, or like taxi matrix, so it's up to you. This one is the simplest and well-known, so we're using that one. And it is so that it's a square root of five. And if you imagine that the square root of five is the smallest uh, distance between all the neurons, we can go to the next step, which is calculating the learning step. And it's super easy because we have the partial distances. We multiply them by the learning coefficient, and then, having those values, we subtract them from the weights of the original, from the winning neuron. So when the new example comes, all those values are updated now. Uh, and to give you more visual aid, so if we imagine a space where our superheroes are located uh, according to the color of their logo, and we have those neurons somewhere in the middle, they will be moving around this solution space, so uh, this unsupervised learning is quite dynamic, until they find their mm, niche, their homeostasis. It doesn't mean they don't move anymore, they just move so little that it doesn't matter any further. So, come, let's come back to the octave and see what we can get. Can we get better using winner takes all or winner takes most? So, winner takes all, it looks maybe not completely different, but we're not adding any bias to the input. And instead of calculating the output of the neuron, we're calculating the distance. And of course, as I previously stated, we're using uh, Euclidean distance, this time, we're also calculating the winner vector, but it will be not only for our convenience, but we need it to select that one neuron that we will let, let learn. So to the l learning part, we just add this, this vector here at the end. So now every winner, so the best vec vector, will have one, and all, all the others will have zero. And thanks to that, we will, we will use it just to direct which, one, which neurons should be taught, should, should learn. I will show you simultaneously the winner takes most algorithm because as you probably see, I will just move it a bit so it's more aligned to one another. They don't really, you don't really change as much. The only change is this part here. So we do, we're creating this neighborhood, this ranking that I said previously, but this time, we don't use only ones and zeros, but we create this whole range of values. And the distance is, is created, this neighborhood is created using exponential function, in which we take into consideration the distance that we calculated previously, and the number of epochs. So this additional idea is that when we show the whole set of examples, uh, at the beginning, our neurons are more adventurous. So they're, they're searching a bit more, but uh, the, the more they, are, they learn, the less we want them to be less eager to move. So when they find their niche, they will stay there. So that's why we're, we're also adding this epoch here. And the neighborhood is used instead of the winning vector at the end of the same teaching algorithm that was used. Uh, and just how the test goes, uh, this time we'll also show those superheroes for 100 times, and this uh, learning coefficient is slightly bigger than in Hebian learning, and the same goes for winner takes most. We're just additionally providing the epoch number so we can narrow down this neighborhood. Okay, so I will run the winner takes all algorithm, and you see we have four groups now. And if I run it several more times, you will see that, yeah, the groups looks, look fine. Uh, they look different, but better than in Hebian learning. 
But as you can see in this last one, I got only three neurons responding. So maybe we can fix that and have something that will respond even better. So I will just run the winner takes most. And you can see that now we also have four groups and I will run it several more times. You will say that it's a lot more stable than previously because it would take me uh, more time to find this abnormal behavior when not all neurons have their niches. So I would just stay with what we have now, uh, whatever it is. And well, okay, so I've shown you those groups, but in fact, if I would like to razzle dazzle you, uh, I could just do it randomly. So just to show you that it's nothing random, I will add our superhero to the mix, and we will check to s what superheroes it is similar. So I will just start with Hebian learning, and you know uh, we should come up with some values for a superhero. But you know always be yourself. But if you can be Batman, just be Batman. So we'll use Batman instead of our values, so it's quicker and easier for us. I will just run all of the stuff. Now winner takes all algorithm. Okay, so it won't be so easy to remember because the groups are at the end, but I will try. Okay, so it's the third group, the fourth group, and the first one. Lukas, please remember them okay. for me. <laughs> so with the Hebian learning, Batman is in the third group. So I will just scroll up to find our Hebian learning. And it's the third group. So he's with Spider-Man, with Wolverine, there is Captain America, there is The Thing, Luke Cage, She-Hulk, and Mrs. Marvel. Okay, quite a huge group, because th they look equally divided. So now it's the fourth group for yep. winner-takes-all algorithm. Uh, and it's, again, it's Wolverine, it's Captain America, it's The Thing, it's Luke Cage, it's She-Hulk, it's Mrs. Marvel, and we have additionally Daredevil here. And for the winner takes most, so it's the last one, that's the easiest, the fourth group. The uh, first one. Again, we have Wolverine, we also have Black Panther and Spider-Man. There is again Captain America, again Luke Cage and Mrs. Marvel. So you can see that although really didn't care so much about the parameters, and Hebian learning seemed so, ah, uh, it made only two groups, but it still could find similarities between superheroes. Maybe a bit worse than winner takes all or winner takes most because they divided those superheroes more equally, but still you can see it finds the similarities quite well. Okay, so let's come back to the presentation for several more minutes. Uh, so you can see it gives more diverse groups, it's what we wanted. It doesn't cluster into those singular neurons so much, but it still has some issues because if we take winner takes all, and somehow we don't care how we divide uh, how our stuff on the solution space, we can come up with such a situation that all the examples are in one place and all the neurons are clumped in the other. And if we use the winner takes all algorithm, one neuron will respond. And every time this one neuron will respond, because it will be the closest one to this group of answers. So the idea is that in winner takes all, we should really try to spread our examples on the solution space and try to also spread those neurons uh, because otherwise we can have those uh, starving neurons. Maybe not so many, but probably one or two may appear. And if the winner takes most, this one is fixed, but it will take more epochs to learn. So we would have to uh, code some, st some sort of uh, dynamic epochs number uh, according to the uh, difference or the error margin we want to have. So it's still not the best idea, but... Yeah, so to the finish, yeah? Yes, to the finish, because this person is incidentally Finnish. Uh, this is Professor Tuevo Kohonen from Finland, and what he created is called self-organizing map. And although it sounds like something completely new, this is something I want to leave, leave you with because it's, uh, it's a fun extension to the winner takes most algorithm. Uh, because in fact, it looks a bit scary, but if you look at the image, uh, we have now this neighborhood that is fixed. We don't create ranking every time. We, have, we create a kind of grid uh, and each vertex in that grid is a new neuro neuron uh, and those neurons 
are dragged onto the solution space. So what we want to achieve in the end is that all our solutions are covered with this grid of points as tightly as we can, like you know, you cover yourself with a blanket in the winter, cold winter nights. So this is the idea. And <coughs> what Professor Kohonen did is he fixed the problem that th of the starving neurons. Of course, it might be so that some neurons will still starve because, as we said, machine learning is not perfect. But this is as close to perfect as we can be with unsupervised learning. So just to wrap it all up for you, so unsupervised and supervised learning as every randomized optimization can stick into local optimums and you know doesn't give you the same answer every time you run it, every time you teach it. But it also gives you something that is very precious because it gives you <coughs> what you need, not what you think you want. Because probably we all want something perfect. We all strive for perfection, but perfect stuff isn't really so easy to be created or used in the real world because mathematically we can prove that this uh, ideal stuff exists. But then creating it or even paying for the materials might be not so easy. So if we add everything what we need to the function that then evaluates our model, then you will get exactly what you encoded into that function. So you can take into consideration the cost of the materials, the time, and so on. And then you will get something good enough. And sometimes good enough is exactly what you need. So um, it's we're near the end, so I will just give a quick look into bibliography. So here at the top, uh, it's the link to our presentation. So in this zip, there is all our codes, this presentation, plus additional derivatives calculations made, a, made by Wukash. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter if you like. Yes, we will give the, uh, the link also there. Uh, the two next links are for the Coursera courses. The first one also uses Octave. So if you remember something from our presentation, you can use it there too. Uh, it's a good way to start machine learning from the mathematical point of view. Then there is uh, a paid deep learning uh, course, which is also great. Yeah, but you can see the videos for free, so yes. it's cool. So you can start with that. There are some books that we really encourage you to take a look because they're great. And down in the middle, there are just links to the stuff we used here. <laughs> Yeah, so, so we'll be around the venue for the whole day, so feel free to talk with us. We'll really be happy to talk with you, to learn from each other. If you'd like me to calculate the derivatives for yeah. you, I can take the pen and paper and do it yeah. for you. You do it live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and now I think that's the time for the Qu questions, if there are any. Okay. Are there any questions? I can see. Okay, so I so think that's all. Yes. Feel free to talk to us. Yeah. And please evaluate our function. Uh, our <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh our yeah, presentation. presentation. Yeah. Because that's what we really appreciate. Because yeah. every the speakers do all of this stuff for, for you, for attending this. We really yeah. appreciate your feedback. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much, guys.